young black man who was shot by a lethal weapon when uh, the circle of the wasn't full. Thank you. Bruce Allison? Yeah. I'm Bruce Allison. I'm, a, uh, I'm in favor of your action because I was held at October 10th in the building that we were saying that the population of the city could use a vacant building. I was held knee to the ground. If the, this officer had a weapon, because uh, while being knee to the ground, I did not say polite words to the officer. He was swearing at me to relax. He was saying that he would beat me up if I didn't. If he had a taser, he would have used it. Yep. Also, I am a veteran with post-traumatic syndrome. I get nervous when they're in tight orders like that. But as a reporter, I was supposed to stay in my position. Thank you very much, and thank you for this action. It's very brave of you. Thank you. Uh, Simon? Artist spoken. Oh, okay. Um, Mesha? Uh, I must say that I'm a bit perplexed by the fact that we are being asked not to make any good or inappropriate comments. Uh, that would have never been our intention. We are professional and also a citizen coming to address a group of honorable professionals. Um, my son, as you may know, was shot 48 times and he was by father, father by SFPD 11 years ago at the National Theater. Uh, I'm being asked by reporter all the time, do you think that you would be alive today if this officer had tasers? With the kind of commotion that he was inside of the metro, he would not have been shot to death, he would have been zapped to death. So, uh, you know, that's no consolation to me that uh, police may get tasers now. Also, as a normal diabetic, I'm uh, subject to uh, seizures, hypoglycemic seizures, and during the pre seizure activity, I may yell, turn around, curse, fall, appear combative, erratic or disoriented. So I'm a prime candidate for tasering, as well as people suffering from epilepsy, people uh, suffering from autism. We do not want SFPD to be harmed with torture devices against the disabled. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. The Bakersfield Police Department picked my son on the 4th of July because they didn't have tasers, but they also didn't have CIT training. The pictures weren't wonderful to look at, but at least he didn't get electroshock therapy, and that's what a taser does, is it delivers an electroshock therapy. The point of the matter is, if the Kern County Mental Health Department had responded to my request that I made last December, indicating my son was deteriorating, he would have never been beaten. Let's stop trying to make our cops mental health delivery experts. They're not. And let's start putting the burden back on the public mental health officials whose statutory duty is to protect the health and safety of the entire community. Adopt Laura's law. Thank you. The uh, D.G. Bowler.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Stacey Bowler. I'm speaking for the Great Panthers and as a fellow citizen. And thank you all for what you represent. Um, I want to say that there are, I'm going to have to read this because I get nervous and I can't remember what I'm trying to say. Uh, many fellow citizens who support the intent of this resolution uh, would appreciate your passing it as an advisory to the police commission. People need all the protection they can get from police violence of all kinds, including electroshock and tasers. On the other hand, they need all the exposure to beauty as possible. That this statement may seem absurd or irrelevant is the evidence that this society has become as ugly as it has with violence of all kinds. Kindness is one form of beauty. The limits of kindness have not been adequately explored. As we've heard tonight, alternatives to repression. I can't read that. Need to be explored. The police need to be so advised. And this resolution is a very good way to do that. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Colleen, and I work with Homeless, what, homeless Youth Alliance. Um, we are a so social service provider to homeless youth in the hate. Um, many of these youth have um, significant me mental health issues, and also, um, because they're homeless, have a lot of interaction with the, with the police, um, especially since you know things like sitting on the sidewalk are <laughs> currently illegal in the city. Um, one of the things that I, I think is important to note here, given that we're talking about this at the Mental Health Board, um, is that the way that the police have caged this particular um, go around of, of trying to acquire tasers is that they're saying that they want to specifically arm the CIT trained police officers with tasers. Um, and I think that we really need to have an in-depth discussion about what CIT is, and, and, and I can't in two minutes, but I can say that um, CIT is supposed to be um, a tool to de-escalate these crisis mental health, mental health situations of mental health crisis, um, and to only arm um, folks that are specifically trained to work with people with mental illness and mental, in mental health crisis um, with tasers, I think is a huge, um, not only a legal problem, but a, a significant policy problem when we're talking about how we are interacting with our um, people with mental health crisis who are in crisis and who are interacting with the, the police department. Um, I also think that um, it's very, it can be very dangerous for somebody experiencing mental health problems, as well as folks who are experiencing um, problems with drugs and who are currently intoxicated um, to be tasered. And in fact, those are some of the people that the studies have shown to result in death. In the case. Hi again, Delphine Brody, California Network for Mental Health Science. I want to strongly, strongly support um, this resolution. Thank you so much for, for proposing this. Uh, this is absolutely apropos. Um, given that tasers clearly are lethal for many of us, in particular those who are in custody, um, those who are taking uh, prescribed antipsychotic medications, who are at an increased risk of heart attack, um, those who have acute agitation resulting from uh, their emotional distress, each of these folks are at high risk for, for death if, if they get tasered. Um, the, the high cost of this 
uh, of providing uh, officers with tasers, sorry, $1,000 per unit, um, including the, the holsters, cartridges, and defibrillators. Uh, this could be applied to offering de-escalation training for, uh, for more officers um, and peer-led social inclusion training for more officers as part of the CIT. Memphis doesn't use it, neither should San Francisco. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Harry Perry, sir. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, no matter which way you vote tonight, at some point in the future, you may hear, you may be listening to radio or watching television and hear that someone in the San Francisco Police Department accidentally shot someone with a taser. Either they mistook the taser for a gun or some, something else happened. And I want all of you to remember this day and remember how you voted. And I hope that you do the right thing, which is vote uh, against tasers, which really uh, would be unbelievable to many San Franciscans if they actually even knew this was being considered. Most of them don't because the press doesn't cover it. And there's obviously, again, a lot of money behind this. So uh, for that reason, they keep pushing, and lobbyists keep pushing, even though we know tasers are a bad idea. So I just want you to remember <coughs> that you know, in the future, which way you voted on this and how you feel. When you hear that, you at least know if you voted against this that you did the right thing. You tried to prevent this coming from San Francisco. We can't always prevent the forces of insanity, but we can uh, often speak and vote against them even if that vote is ultimately unsuccessful. I hope all of you will be behind the scenes, whatever you can, to prevent tasers from ever coming here to San Francisco. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brian Upland. Um, I have already introduced myself as someone who's not from this state, but um, may consider moving to San Francisco. I think it's a beautiful city. Um, in my consideration of moving to a city, I would not, I, you know, there's uh, violence, and uh, police violence is a very serious, real uh, form of violence, often racist, paranoid, comes without any provocation whatsoever. Um, I think the police in general is an institution that needs to be um, uh, de-armed. They need their deadly weapons taken away from them instead of um, adding deadly weapons to their armory. Um, I'm you know, already a little bit turned off from your neighbor, Oakland, due to the uh, police violence um, they have showed against peaceful protesters. And I think that um, following that tone and limiting the violent capabilities of officers is the right path. Thank you. Thank you. for justice and accountability and a uh, concerned uh, citizen. I have uh, no ax to grind and uh, no stop in any taser companies and uh, uh, pretty much as an, an interested observer. Um, I'm kind of uh, surprised at um, the amount of, of violence um, directed at mental health consumers and patients and um, I, uh, for, for this reason, I support the proposed resolution. I don't think uh, tasers are a good idea. Um, it, it seems to me, and I, I mean, I, I've never been, been in this situation, but I, I've heard the, the people uh, uh, you know, who spoke. It seems that in a volatile situation, the important thing is to diffuse and de-escalate, and that it would be way too easy to uh, commit grievous harm towards um, a helpless and probably agitated person who's not really dangerous, but um, you know, who's only uh, suffering and, and who needs help. And I'm surprised, why, why is the police, and it should be the job of mental health to deal with all this, not the police. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I, I think there should be a discussion apart from that, but, um, Thank you for the resolution, and I uh, support it. Thank you.
Good evening again. Thank you for uh, hearing my commentary. And thank you. I'd like to extend thanks to Dr. Lewis for introducing this resolution. I'd like to extend thanks to the Mental Health Board for considering this very well written resolution. I'd just like to add a few details, didn't quite make it in, that uh, further support why this should absolutely be passed. 755 people dead in the United States since 1983. 170 in California. Across the nation, approximately 301% disproportionate use against African Americans. And in California, the highest group targeted, that is the highest group that have been victims of taser-related deaths at a tune of 45% is uh, Latinos or otherwise uh, rendered as Hispanics. The victims, the people who are the most likely victims uh, of, of death at the hands of taser are autistic children, seniors, homeless people, people with metabolic disorders, disabled people, epileptic people, uh, people high on drugs or alcohol, uh, and t approximately 20% of taser related deaths in the US are mental, people with mental health conditions. This is absolutely appropriate resolution to be passed by this board. I congratulate you again for introducing it. And as a formerly epileptic black man that uh, has dealt with various mental health issues, I pray that you continue to push against this because this can save lives. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, uh, thank the board for this uh, this resolution. Is I, I just really appreciate it. It's well documented. It references a lot of numbers, so it gives a real good understanding based upon numbers about the effects of tasers. And um, I, um, you know, I, I I do appreciate the San Francisco Police Department. I can say that they have saved a loved one's life of mine. They are the department that, that gets people into treatment in some cases. And, uh, and I also understand an argument for tasers is, uh, you know, as an alternative to lethal force. And certainly I want my loved one to be as safe as possible, but I'm concerned that, that actually with the use of taser, that's actually gonna increase the jeopardy for my loved one's life and the risk when, when there's an interaction with police. And so I really appreciate this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Yes, uh, I'm Phil Mastercola. Thank you for uh, bringing this. And I think that it's important uh, for all of us to review the history, a long and convoluted history of the CIT and, uh, and now this new twist that's been introduced uh, as, a, as a weapon, a tool for CIT. Uh, back in uh, 2001, the Mental Health Board Executive Director Helena Brooks, uh, producing Mental Health Outreach Director Mary Kate Connor and retired LSAT PD Lieutenant Michael Sullivan created this training, CIT training, as many of you probably already know. Uh, it was modeled after the successful Memphis training. They have no tasers. It works beautifully there. Um, and it was um, directed by the Board of Supervisors in a unanimous vote that 25% of, of the police force will be trained every fiscal year starting in 2002 by the uh, uh, police department's own uh, records recently, only 74 officers have been trained. So even though there's been a, a very strong commitment by the Board of Supervisors and the Police Commission over two or three times where this issue's come up, the training has not been made, that have been done. And the commitment clearly has not been made to CIT. So the idea that, that the tasers are gonna be implementing CIT is really, uh, I think less than a sincere statement. And I think this is why it's important that the resolution passes because without the use of tasers, Memphis has had a successful program. 
no fatalities in Memphis. And uh, you've heard the number of fatalities in, in the state of California in recent years. So for this reason, it's important to have this resolution. And this board speak for the community. Forums were, were just to be instituted back in 2011. They weren't done. Thank you. And they haven't been done in the last four months either. Thank you. Before I call the last speaker, um, since he cited my role in the former police uh, crisis intervention training, between 2001 and 2010, we trained 983 officers, so a lot more than 74. Um, I think that number may be just the recent uh, revised training. Eduardo Vega. <sighs> Thank you, Commissioners. Um, I applaud you for this resolution, which I think is, a, is an important statement. Um, I want to associate myself also with my colleague, uh, Dr. Gifford, uh, Boyce Gifford of uh, NAMI, San Francisco. Um, and in that both the Mental Health Association and NAMI San Francisco have been working actively with the police department um, to implement a new CIT crisis intervention team model. And there have been several hiccups in the, in the process of implementing that. Um, I think that also both ourselves at the Mental Health Association and NAMI feel that the introduction of a new discussion about weaponry is not appropriate to the development of the CIT as it's, as it's founded and based on the principles that we have. I've worked in mental health uh, settings and crisis settings in five states over 20 years. Um, I've been in uh, the presence of people who are actively uh, homicidal with weapons. Um, I myself have uh, attempted my own suicide. I can say one thing, uh, which is you don't need weapons, even in the most dire circumstances. And the de-escalation training and nonviolent alternatives we're proposing are very important. We would propose that um, uh, a ride-along program or a joint response program in which the police are not put into the front of situations that involve people with in psychiatric crisis is a good alternative and it's been impl implemented in several places. And we think peers could have an important role in this. But the one more thing I want to bring up to you while I have a minute of your time, which is today we will focus on a couple of very important issues, but issues that really look at the negative the negative, I would say, the shadow of mental health and mental illness. That is to say, these issues, where the focus is on violence, where the focus is on coercion, um, these you, promulgate the stigma that then in turn drives people away from Thank services, you. drives people Thank you, to Mr. death Vanda. by suicide. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I, I would like to speak. I didn't get a speaking Did card. May I? Name? May I speak? Yes. Are you recording? I apologize. I didn't get a speaker card because I've been videoing this process. Um, but I'm very compelled by all the states, statements that have been made here today. And uh, I, too, agree that the police department should not be forced to provide social services, mental health uh, mental health services are responsible for taking care of people who have psychiatric disabilities. And the police should not be put in this position. I also like to say that the the thread uh, running through all of the comments, both about Laura's law and about this very excellent Taser resolution, which I hope you pass today, uh, is respect respect and the ability to speak directly to a person on their own level and engage with them in a way that is equalizing and shows that you understand them and you're concerned about them. I've talked to de-escalation experts who say and verify that if you treat somebody with dignity and respect, it is the best form of de-escalation you can provide them. And you, that you can help anyone in a mental health crisis. 
and not have to force them to take medications or put them in a situation where they will be electrocuted. And I appreciate very much your allowing me to speak last. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I would like to ask, did you give your name, please? My name is Charles Pitts. Okay. Um, I think I think my problem with the whole scenario is, is like I think the resolution to have um, the police the police not have. Um, well, I'm I'm anti-tainted. That's the that's the quick thing. I just, I just see it as a situation where it lowers the threshold for police being violent towards people. Um, I also believe that we should, uh, I, just, I just feel like the police are just very violent towards people. Um, the incident that I know of, like a Darren Hanna, they, first they punched him and beat him, and then they like tased him like eight times, and then like, the coroner comes up with this fictitious report. <laughs> um, so I just feel that um, the police need more training as to how to deal with people with mental health issues and how not to escalate problems. Um, it just seems like I, my, 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 the issue that, the incident that I had with a police officer, it's like, I mean, I wasn't trying to be violent towards him or anything. I didn't threaten him. I just tried to invoke my rights to be silent. And, you know, he's threatening to murder me. And um, if this officer had a taser, he might have tased me several times. So, um, I mean, the police have so many weapons. And I think we shouldn't have these officers having more weapons to be violent towards a citizen. Thank you. I would like to um, ask Commander Ali, who oversees the Crisis Intervention Team for the San Francisco Police Department, to share with the board why cases are needed for CIT officers. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mikhail Ali. I'm a 20-year veteran with San Francisco Police Department. I've had a varied uh, experience in the department. Uh, working uniform patrol, working investigations. I was the uh, lieutenant in charge of our child abuse and exploitation unit. I worked five years in our gang unit. I've done an awful lot with the project from the time that I've been here. I was appointed the coordinator of the crisis intervention team. Sir, could you talk into the mic? Close to the mic. Let me bring this up. It's right here. In the way. I was uh, put in charge of the crisis intervention team in September of 2011. And at that time, there was a crisis intervention partnership that consisted of a multitude of uh, entities, including uh, Veterans Affairs, uh, NAMI, the Mental Health Association of San Francisco, the Public Defender's Office, uh, San Francisco General uh, Psychiatric Emergency Services, and a slew of other individuals who simply wanted to see a difference and how uh, our department responded to individuals in crisis. Um, I offer to you that this is not just a, an issue about mental illness. This is about people who are in crisis. This is about people who, for whatever reason, are in conflict with members of society, and law enforcement is called to come and intervene. And so the, the focus of the training that we've had since 2001 has always been about an awareness level of people in crisis and an appreciation of that to the tune of engaging in a manner that doesn't escalate. You know, if you simply take the same rule of medicine of doing no harm, that's our, our motto, of doing no harm. When we're called to the scene of an incident where somebody's in crisis and they represent no threat to them, to, to anyone other than themselves. It's those instances where an individual in crisis, whether it's because of some social issue that has developed in their life, some personal uh, news of a, of a loved one's death, a pending divorce, whatever the case may be, and has caused them to act outside of the norm, we need to remember. And as long as they present only a threat, they present no threat to anyone other than themselves, our policy is to take as much time as we possibly can to mitigate that problem. Pardon me. This is not a new issue in San Francisco. 
Chief Heather Farn brought this issue up when she was chief. Chief George Gascon brought it up, now Chief Sir. Because they've all seen instances in which if we had best practice tool in San Francisco, we could not, we could, we could mitigate the need to take a life. Case in point, the most recent incident in July of this year, where an individual who was in a state of crisis, the information the police department received by 911 gave us no light of the history of, of mental illness. What we had to deal with were these facts. This individual uh, came at a coworker, slicing the coworker's arm, and then proceeded to come at the coworker first. His sister begged you not to use him as an example. Excuse me, please. His sister please. begged you excuse not me. to use him as an example. Excuse me, please. I can rest assured that we, treat, we train our CIT officers to engage people very respectfully. That would, that's not appropriate. And it's the second time you've done that. Appreciate you know, you just sit there and be quiet. This is a, this, in this instance, it simply was a matter of the officers engaging this person for over 10 minutes. 10 minutes, and only until such time as the person went to a populated area did they have to intervene. The officers went so far as unholstering and, and holstering their weapons, letting them know that they weren't a threat. And it was only when the individual charged at the officer with a knife, with a, with a knife did a use of force uh, take place. Uh, I've spoken to the officers involved. I've reviewed the facts of that case, and I wholeheartedly believe that if those officers were equipped with electronic control weapons, it's likely that person would be alive today and likely on the road protesters. This weapon system, you know, and, it's, and I, I, I've taken a lot of notes relative to some of the comments uh, made by some of the speakers, and I'll speak to them. It is a tragedy that the law enforcement agencies across the country have to be the conduit by which mental health services in some instances are provided. You know, it's a shame that the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department is the largest provider of mental health services in the world. That's a tragic reality. So the reality is our officers in the field are dealing with people in crisis, oftentimes much more frequently than professional mental health providers. That's not something that we can change. What we can change is how we engage them and how we mitigate the need for use of force. Um, there was a, a common relative to veterans, and I'll bring this up. Um, I think it's in, in, incredibly important that our officers in our department are aware of the dynamics of with veterans. When we're talking about eight personality type people who are trained in the use of deadly force, and when they're in conflict, that can be a terrible thing. So one of our uh, uh, efforts in our department is simply to recruit veterans who, who have served our country, and who are now police officers in San Francisco. And it's quite simple. A veteran is going to be able to relate to a veteran better than a non-veteran and hopefully that in itself would help mitigate. Um, our department has a history of cultural competency training, of community engagement, of mental health training. Uh, it was presented that there were some, only 74 officers trained, as uh, Elena Brooks points out. Over the 10 year period, we had some 983 members of our department trained in a 40 hour block of training in mental health awareness. Uh, since I took the uh, uh, coordinator's position in September 20, 2011, we have trained to date 116 officers in the new model. And the new model is just, it built upon what we previously did. The new model is about creating, uh, uh, engaging the officers, making certain that they develop the uh, de-escalation skill. First of all, and foremost, selecting officers who uh, show a, uh, a propensity to engage people without the use of force. That's the first and foremost that we want to do. And then secondly, provide them with the training that's going to allow them, hopefully, to de-escalate situations. Um, I, I often say to my officers, because I don't want them to walk away with the burden of thinking that every single situation is manageable. You're professionals, you know that it's not. Uh, United States Department of Justice statistics indicate very clearly that assault against mental health workers and professionals is right up there against assaults against law enforcement officers. 
quite simply, words do not always work. And when they don't work, what do we want our officers in the field to do? When they're limited in terms of the equipment that they have to stop a person from being a danger to others. And that's precisely why this conversation has, uh, has begun again. Chief Sir uh, and myself uh, were tr truly troubled by the reality that we put our officers in a situation where we do not give them the best tools out there to de-escalate, and they have to live the reality of taking someone's life. And I offer to you, I've been an officer in this department for 20 years. I don't know a single person who wants to take someone's life. I do not. Our people are good people, and they want to make a difference in people's lives. They want to help them get over the hiccups that these crises create. I offer my words to you. I thank you for your time, and I'll address any questions that you have. Okay, yes. Um, does a taser look like a gun? It is shaped like a gun. Uh, there have been some developmental changes in the uh, various products. Uh, the product that we are looking at, in fact, is a, is a completely yellow product. So as I hold it in my hand, there is no black whatsoever. It's completely yellow. Our policy, in terms of the draft policy, the draft policy, if you're interested in seeing it, is currently posted on the uh, police department's website under police commission announcements. And in that policy, it, it makes it very clear that one, even if we were to deploy them with, with it, it would have to be on your body opposite of where the firearm actually is. And is that, is that idea so that uh, someone on the other side of this would instantly recognize that it is not a weapon, meaning not a gun. It's twofold. We do not, we want the person to recognize that it is not a weapon, but we also want to make sure that the officer doesn't mistakenly grab a firearm. Okay, yes. I have a, a comment and a question. I almost feel as though this discussion is around whether um, Guns should be used for the first time in San Francisco, and perhaps there would be poor divisiveness. Um, what, in your estimation, Officer Lee, is the potential for impulsive and proper use of tasers, and what review process will occur? Well, I offer to you that I think the San Francisco Police Department is probably one of the most scrutinized agencies in this country. We have an independent civilian oversight board of seven members, four of which are appointed by the, the mayor, three, three of which are appointed by the Board of Supervisors. We have an independent investigative body in the form of the Office of Citizens' Complaints. We have an internal affairs investigative unit that investigates any form of misconduct. And so in this instance, I, I, I believe that if there is any deviation from policy, and appropriateness of, of the use of this type of weapon, this weapon system, that we have mechanisms in place to ensure that that behavior is addressed and addressed accordingly. And just by reading, if you read the policy, we make it very clear in what parameters in which these uh, this weapon system can be used. If you wish, I can quote a little from it. Will there be a review within a specific period of time on the use of the tasers? The use of force is an immediate review. Anytime an officer of the police department uses force, a, a sergeant is required to respond and make an evaluation as to whether or not that use of force was appropriate. There are certain uses of force that require notifications to the various entities. Obviously, the use of the firearm requires that we notify the district attorney's office, the office of OCC, our chain of command. I'm off duty at home, I'll come in as part of the investigation. Uh, our internal affairs division in the, the home now. If there's any indicator that an officer misused the force, there is to, there is to be an immediate investigation. Okay, yes, lady. I have a question about um, the luggage that is used. Is it one set amount? Can you lower it? Or is it enough to hurt a person? And how, how badly is the person usually hurt? Is there a specific uh, weight that, uh, that it, uh, 
might be more harmful to a smaller person rather than a, a bigger, heavier person? There, there definitely will be impacts on different size people. Being a larger man is going to impact me differently than perhaps someone who is more frail or skinny. Accordingly, our policy uh, indicates the circumstances in which we should not do it against the elderly, against a, a visibly pregnant person, against young people, against someone who is uh, very thin and frail. Those persons are identified as not being uh, uh, the appropriate uh, uh, persons in which we're, we're using this weapon system, and that's within the policy. And to go further with your question, it's it's there there are 50 that you know it's not the the, the votes it's the average. Uh, I'm not a scientist and I can't I, I can't get into that. There's an indicator that someone is tased eight times. Um, I don't know how you know that happens. We have a policy that would say that says that if it were to be used, each and every cycle has to be justified. If you cycle it one time as a five second cycle, you have to present articulable facts that justify that one cycle. If you cycle it the second time, you have to have justifiable facts as to why you cycled it a second time. If you cycle it a third time, it requires notifications on a higher level to the captains of the district stations for inquiry. Our policy prohibits using it more than three cycles, three five second cycles. And those are the cycles, the time of which is built into the device itself. What's the voltage? It's a 50,000 watt uh, voltage. I believe it's somewhere in the, in the three to four amperage area. How does that compare to the electric chair? It's I, one I, quarter. I'm not, I'm not a scientist. I could not explain to you how that compares. Interesting enough, our department was on a path of providing on officer body cameras um, to, to officers. Uh, what that means is there's some 17,000 uh, law enforcement vehicles in the country that have uh, camera systems in their in the car itself. Uh, you've seen cops, you've seen all the video footage covered, captured. Them. The newest technology is actually to place a camera system on an officer. Um, we're in the process of acquiring those camera systems. Uh, we've written the draft policy, we've deployed it. Uh, we look, we've looked at a number of products and we believe we were in a position to select one. There, there, there is no, at this time, no connection between making sure that every officer that has a taser also has a uh, body camera. That's something that's up for discussion. Uh, but we t intend to have significantly more body cameras out in the field to the tune of over 200 than we do with uh, the uh, electronic control weapons. The reason I ask is I think it can help protect against accusations of abuse uh, since there could be video and audio documentation. And that's precisely one of the reasons why um, we intended to go with body cameras. We found that studies show that when agencies use body cameras, you see their complaints drop by some 90 plus percent. Uh, the officers, you know, we, you, you act your best when you're okay. Yeah. And that's what's going on. We're able to get the best of our, of our officers. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're going to be Thank you so much, Paul. That's why we live stream. Ms. Brooke, I will read out your name. Oh, I'm sorry, what? Roll call vote. Yes, I will read out your name and vote either A or A. Uh, Ms. Laura Alcuellas? A. A is in favor of the resolution, obviously, nay is opposed. Ms. Kari Chen? 
And please say it loudly, I'm getting old. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Um, Ms. Lynn Fuller left. Uh, Ms. Wendy James. Eight. I can't hear you. Eight. All right. Uh, Mr. Ellis Joseph. I'm trying to hear whether it's A or if it, 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 A is yes and A is no. Please move your piece of paper. Wendy, did you say yes or no? All right, say yes or no, maybe that'll be easier. Yes. yes. Yeah. All right, so yes, no, uh, Ms. Arguelles, yes. Ms. Carrie, yes. Yes? Yes. Um, Ms. Wendy James, yes. Yes. Mr. Joseph, yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> Ms. Alyssa Landy? Yes. Dr. David Lewis? Yes. Ms. Virginia Lewis? Yes. Ms. Lena Miller? Yes. Dr. Terrace Patterson? No. Mr. Alphonse Bin? Yes. Mr. Earl Wisham? No. Okay, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeses and two noes, the motion passes. Yeah. Mental Health Board that voted in support of not using tasers for the police department and uh, we're real happy about that and uh, I guess now I'm going to be going over to the sleep in over at the University of California San Francisco so uh, stick with me there and I'll talk to you in a few minutes bye-bye